this is just for the students who uh, would like to uh, uh, review this uh, uh, later on if they missed it. We can see your slides. No, I just got to get my setup right. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, let's get started. So um, I'm here um, with a company called Parity Technologies um, that was founded roughly five years ago um, by key alumni of the Ethereum Foundation back then in, in summer 2015. Um, some of you um, might familiar, uh, be more familiar with my co-founders. Um, one of them is more prominent. Uh, his name is Gavin Wood. He uh, was one of the co-founders of uh, the Ethereum Foundation um, even before that and was very instrumental in launching that, in building the technology, describing, specifying um, the Ethereum virtual machine and then implementing the first client. And um, since two, in the, over the last four years or so, Parity Technologies, um, I, I would say, has uh, really become one of the most rightly um, um, accepted and, um, you know, recognized infrastructure provider in, in, in the blockchain space. And in over these four years, I think we have grown from um, when I got involved six people to uh, now roughly 140 people, of which some are um, um, very, very, very respected individuals in communities such as peer-to-peer -peer networking, distributed computing, and uh, the Rust programming language particularly. The, um, and here, just to give you some faces, that is us, I think, uh, actually one and a half years ago. Um, that would look a lot bigger by now. Um, the other entity that um, we involved with, and that has to do with our means, is the Web3 Foundation. So um, that's um, a Stiftung, a Swiss Stiftung, um, situated in in Zug uh, near Zurich in 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 Switzerland, and um, it has a deed, it has a mission. And I want to read that to you for a second because it will kind of give an entrance to what I'm going to talk about next. So the Web3 Foundation deed, right? They are ingrained uh, mission um, that they um, are responsible for um, towards um, the auditor in Switzerland says that the Web3 Foundation nurtures and stewards technologies and applications in the fields of decentralized web software protocols, particularly those which utilize modern cryptographic methods to safeguard decentralization to the benefit and for the stability of the Web3 ecosystem. So at this point, like if I, if I came across that five years ago, I, I would first ask, what the fuck is Web3? Like, um, what, what are these people talking about here? Now, um, and that is what I want to spend my next 10 minutes or so on. Um, walk you a bit through um, what is Web3, why you should care about it, and what it will look like, what we believe it will look like. So let's get started. So why should you care? And what's wrong with Web2? Well, Web2.0, right? The web that we use today mostly was fundamentally designed around existing notions of trust, right? Um, trusting company apps, right? Trusting um, bank servers with more data than ever before. And in using those application, right? We are giving away more of our data information preferences than ever before. Uh, in a very unprecedented way, actually. And these companies, or in some cases, access of power, abusing that information in, in many instances. And I think over the years, well, like we've, we've all um, been given uh, quite a few examples through um, press. One of them ob obviously was NSA leak, right? In, in which it was uncovered that Intel giants let governance tap your data. And that program uh, was called PRISM, as most of you know, which involved the NSA accessing the emails, documents, photographs, and other sensitive data of users of nine of the largest companies of that world, including Facebook and Google and so forth. And I think one particularly um, 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 one point that makes it particularly obvious how problematic it is that is is that um, at one point this program Prism had become the NSA's top source of raw intelligence, accounting for nearly fifteen percent of intelligence reports, and serving as the most prolific contributor to President Barack Obama's daily briefings. Um, that the Washington Post reported a while ago. 
And like we have numerous um, such examples, right? Such as uh, the, the 250 million year program that the US put together to covertly um, um, enter partnerships with tech companies um, that allow these agencies um, to insert secret vulnerabilities into encryption software. Now, among other things, it was as well revealed that agency officials conducted keyword searches and email searches on committee stuff, right? Senate committee stuff while they used the network. But, you know, it's, it, it wasn't only seen in those cases where those companies that were the, the, the gatekeeper, the, the, the trust person of that data was actively giving away your information. No, we had also instances where um, just uh, this system security couldn't, couldn't be trusted, right? Um, and in the case here, we had Emmanuel Macron, the French prime minister's campaign being hacked on the eve of the French election. Uh, allegedly by Russian hackers was reported back then. Um, and, you know, the story's gone on. We, we've heard about the credit score firm Equifax that's uh, lost 143 of American social security numbers. Um, and, you know, if you take that all together, you really get the feeling that the tools we rely on in, um, you know, interacting over the internet in our digital lives, right? The tools that we use to interact, communicate, and essentially make decisions are broken. And our only fallback, the one thing that we, you know, um, relied on has been trust. But essentially it was trust in the very same people, the very same institutions that um, apparently has been, as has been shown, want to keep our tools broken. So that, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't really feel right. And, you know, you could go as far as say like, you know, if civilization, all of us together were a person, like we would recognize what we do here as cell phone. That, that can't be right. And I believe that there are a bunch of different factors to this malady that we are um, finding ourselves in, right? One is widespread ignorance, right? Laziness. Um, often it might be greed, right? It might be incompetence and in some cases pride. pride. But one thing is very clear and has become very clear. Power is concentrated now more than ever before. And this, this current opaqueness around it means also that there's extremely little accountability. And I think, you know, if we've seen one thing over the years, over the history of humankind, that too much power accumulation in single points usually lead to um, this power being misused in one way or another against the collective, against the common good. And I personally wish there were means or um, we have found, we would have found means, right, for our species to be able to, you know, potentially be more empathetic to another and relate more to another, feel more connection and therefore be able to trust another more because we know uh, our, our next won't, you know, misuse that power that we give people through our trust. But that's not really how we've seen the world work. And so, the, the thing that I, I can relate to and fall back to and where I see some help is to some extent in technology and better economics, better, better incentive systems, right? With which we hopefully eventually go, go get to a point where we can say like, it's actually in our interactions in our daily life, we require less trust, but we are getting more truth in general. Now, what is Web3? Right, like we've, I think we've all gotten a glimpse of like what, what precarious situation we find ourselves in, but you know, what does that have to do with Rupsi? Well, we're looking to um, see an internet emerge um, that doesn't actually um, give you all that much of a different user experience than what you have today. Right, the difference is really how it's built and uh, the model that underlies this architecture. And to summarize, we usually call Web3 as some sort of extensible framework for creating massively multi-user economically strong applications. Very mouthy, but I think that describes it fairly well. 
Now, um, a couple of things I don't need to tell you guys here. Um, Web3 is backed up by all of our computers around the world. Very simplified, right? The point is we have enough um, uh, checkpoints in order to ensure that the inputs to the systems and um, its, its functioning can't be censored. Now, we want to see a Web3 right that helps you prove yourself, your identity, your intention in an encrypted and secure way. That needs to be part of it. And we really see Web3 having its own governance, right? Supranational governance, where people participating in it can vote for how the system, right, that you use um, evolves over time. And, and we really believe that such a system, such a Web3 system, can help remove the divide between users and service providers and in a lot of cases create so-called prosumers. Now, to summarize and to, to state it relatively bluntly, Web3 is basically just a new way of architecting web applications, right? A new way of designing, architecting, and deploying digital products and services. Now, you know, how are we building towards that? Right, like what, are, what steps are we taking in order to get there? Well, what we want to get is we have the infrastructure and all the tools in place and get a point where you can easily build a so-called decentralized applications that many of you will be familiar with. Our, um, our understanding of these decentralized applications are basically these are multi-user applications that conform to certain constraints, right? And these constraints, very important constraints are that, number one, the rules of all these participants that interact in the system are clearly defined and transparent, right? They can be observed. No user is privileged over others is a priority. And no trust between peers is required. And by no trust, obviously, this is a very tricky conversation. And um, you may also think about um, strongly trust reduced interaction. Now, what do we need to have in place to you know, be able to build these decentralized applications? Well, we think that these decentralized applications need to leverage a number of capabilities, right? Provided largely by underlying protocols that all interact with each other. And there are a few fundamental parts uh, to what we believe will be that tech stack that you need. Um, part of that will be replicated state machines. So these machines that um, can, can keep state and execute certain state transition functions over it, like certain business logic, um, whatever modifications you want to do with these data structures. Now, another one is data distribution protocols, right? Um, how do we ensure in this future, right, where we, um, where we envision a serverless future, right, where people um, interact in a, in a more pure peer-to-peer -peer fashion, right? How do they um, access, for example, their news content, right? That's static data distribution. Transient messaging, how can you enable, how can we enable you to interact with your classmates, right? Write them a message, a transient message. Today you use WhatsApp, today you use um, other means like uh, iMessage and so forth, right? But these are very much centralized and um, are, you are exposed to um, um, the mercy of whoever provides you the service. And very critically, all these different bits and pieces that need to come together need to be usable from users' devices. Otherwise, the whole undertaking is moot. And if you try to squeeze that in the diagram, right, would we envision this Web3 stack, tech stack to look like? It would look something like this here, right? On the bottom, you have to some extent um, our physical internet infrastructure overlaid with a peer-to-peer -peer internet overlay, um, and then a number of core protocols that we believe are necessary and needed for a Web3 to come to fruition. And those are, um, on the very left, you see the zero low trust interaction protocols, right? You could also call them expectation management system, because essentially that's what blockchains do. 
they manage expectations of those that interact with the system. And you um, can have particularly a high trust into um, those expectations that were managed with you, that were set with you by the system are being um, upheld. Now, I already briefly touched on the static data distribution protocol, a system like Swarm, IPFS, um, BitTorrent, and we, we will and want to see in the future some volatile data pub sub messaging protocol, something like Whisper, Telehash, or something akin. They, I, we strongly believe there's still a lot of innovation coming in that space, and we need a couple of years to find um, um, the right sets of protocols here. But Basically, we overlaid our, all these low-level protocols with developer APIs, right? Protocol extensible developer APIs and languages that then um, um, application developers use to construct on design and build these applications that are um, eventually uh, delivered to end consumers. Which then again will observe these applications in some kind of in user interface cradle, right? Something like a browser. None of this will really go away, right? Just what's working behind the scenes may look fundamentally different and the model that this creates, um, the engagement model that that creates might be fundamentally different. Now, now I wanna go a bit more into, uh, into the blockchain tech world and um, tell you a bit what we do there and uh, kind of what we observe um, to be happening at the moment in the blockchain space. And I think to explain that it's, um, it's always a bit easier to, to start from the bottom. So if you think about um, this zero to low trust interaction protocols, right, blockchains, or if you think about it as an expectation management system, the first of its kind was Bitcoin, right? Um, it really showed the world for the first time that a system like that could be built, even though it wasn't general at all, right? It wasn't a general expectation management system. It was built for one specific use case, right? To um, allow simple currency related applications. And, you know, as we went along the years, right? Um, as we worked on Ethereum and Ethereum came out, um, we brought a, a, a couple of substantial steps up from Bitcoin, um, bringing in certain features that I think are fairly powerful. Some of them you might know, right? The much shorter block time, right? A proof of work mechanism that was resistant to hardware optimizations. And most importantly, the much more sophisticated scripting language, right? Solidity, you might be aware of this. And its execution environment, the Ethereum virtual machine. And this really introduced a much more comprehensive, comprehensive abstraction that essentially allowed money to be programmed, really programmed for the first time. And, you know, what came was this really caused a wave of more complex decentralized applications. And we moved more towards the space of seeing how this could be really the basis, the fabric of this new expectation, very general expectation management system for Web3 to be used in all sorts of um, use cases, be it more um, on a certain problem domain, such as, you know, cloud computation or storage, or being it in very specific um, industry use cases. Now, but as the time passed, right, um, I, I think Ethereum launched in, in summer 2015. Uh, we started the company shortly after. Um, at that time, we were entirely focused on Ethereum. Um, we, um, I think like even in 2017, we at one point, we still had um, over 70% of all miners in Ethereum were using our technology. Back then it was called Parity Ethereum to secure the Ethereum blockchain. And as we went along the years, like we got involved into um, many other blockchain technologies, so to say. We built up a research arm and an, uh, a stronger engineering arm and uh, developed production clients for the Bitcoin network, the Zcash network for Ethereum and um, had some, a, a couple of wild tries, just like wild prototypes out there. And we got to the point where um, we realized, you know, 
today you're really, if you want to build an application, right, back in 2016, you had basically had the choice between two things. Either you decided, you know, you build your application, your decentralized application on a smart contract platform, such as Ethereum, right? Or um, you had to build your own custom blockchain, right? With all its bits, bits and pieces, networking, consensus, right? The state machine, whatever it looked like, um, the RPC client and so forth. And let me tell you, from doing it four times within our companies, I can tell you it's a, it's a ton of work, particularly if you start from scratch. It's an incredible lot of work. So what we saw is, um, it's kind of surprising if you think so, why, would, um, why did we see in 2016, 70, so many more blockchain projects start off and say like, well, we can't build on Ethereum, we build a customized blockchain. Well, there are a couple of good reasons for that actually. So the case for custom blockchains are um, fourfold, I think. One is performance, right? Often the bottleneck in, a, in smart contract platforms is the slow virtual machine that it runs, right? And if you optimize the state machine, right, the runtime or whatever you may call it for the single application you have in mind, you can push performance significantly. The second one is the security argument, right? The attack surface of a very general VM, such as the Ethereum virtual machine, a smart contract platform where you can have user deployable code, is very large, mostly because it's complex, right? And that makes it reasonably less secure than something that was built for one purpose and one purpose only, and you can reason about its security properties. Now, another point is sovereignty, right? Um, if you have to share too many, uh, if you have to share a platform, right, to, with too many different um, um, teams and interests, but basically a lot of the decisions that would have to be taken on the platform level affect all of your teams. What happens is, um, from my point of view, what you've seen in Ethereum quite a lot, that you, um, at some point, progress stagnates quite largely. On one hand, on, on the other hand, it may happen that decisions against your interests are taken very strongly. So like you are, if you go down the custom blockchain, you're not as dependent on the platform governance and its incumbents. And last but not least, the flexibility is a great point because, because you, if you build your own blockchain from the ground, right, you're not bound to the platform limitations. So um, as uh, one of the last projects I was speaking about, um, I, just, I just heard you are, um, the end of your presentation, you were speaking about um, blockchain pharma case, I believe, and brought forward that um, you, 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 couldn't, you wouldn't build it on a public blockchain, right? Um, and I, I can fully understand that, right? There are certain um, limitations on today's public blockchain platform. Um, first and foremost for businesses, an issue is um, obviously scalability, but really a lot is also confidentiality. So um, what do people do? Well, they decide if I can't build in my public space, I build on a, on a private blockchain. I use potentially something as Hyperledger Fabric as was brought forward. Now, what that has, and you know, what we've seen actually is that quite a lot of teams in 2017 and 18 decided to go down that route because they, um, they, they couldn't um, go with the limitations that they uh, were faced with um, in Ethereum or these open blockchains that were supposed to be very general and serve as this layer. Now, what that has led to is like that a lot of these new generation blockchains that came out, um, um, essentially, um, we ended up in a, in, a, in a scenario where we have, again, a lot of these data silos, right? All these disparate blockchains that uh, don't talk to each other, um, can't exchange any of the assets and can't uh, benefit from the network effects they would all gain by cooperating, right? It's basically the, the, the whole notion of what we, we hope to get from blockchains in the first place. And even worse, a lot of these blockchains taking the route of, um, because they have the need to connect anyways, they're taking the route of connecting and talking to each other through centralized services, which really defeats the purpose of the blockchain in the first place. 
So what we've gotten is a fairly fragmented landscape. And you know, the missing network effect and connectivity isn't even the worst, so that they can't talk to each other, these different blockchains. What is even worse is by having so many blockchains, each individual one is less secure. And that is because they all basically naturally compete with each other over security resources. They then squander it, right? Because um, in each case, and this is true for, you may be familiar with these terms, proof of work, right? The mining algorithm or proof of stake, where you put a security deposit behind your vote, basically, when you uh, validate a blockchain. Um, essentially, in both cases, you are, each blockchain is competing for the scarce resource. In proof of work, it's mining power, right? The hardware that is being put to work to validate these chains, and in proof of stake, it's money. It's money that's being put behind it. And but essentially, all of these chains that want to exist all want to be secure. There's no there's no argument around that. And this is really uh, where we came in, in in 2017 and said like, um, we we believe from. Um, building these different kind of blockchain and experimenting with that, that the smart contract layer really isn't the layer where we should focus our attention on today, just yet. Um, we got to go a bit more abstract. And that's why we created these two technologies, Polkadot and Substrate. And together, they basically form an open, extensible development platform to fuel, to really supercharge innovation. And hopefully, and I think we, we have seen that over the past year or so, it does close the massive gap between launching a new chain and building a smart contract system. And in that, in that context, to explain you what the difference between these two technologies, Substrate and Polkadot is. Substrate is a blockchain operating system. It's a modular blockchain framework that's both actually underneath Polkadot and on top of Polkadot. I guess it's, it's some very kind of interesting kind of sandwich system that we have here. But so what is Substrate? It's a programming framework designed to make building blockchains orders of magnitude easier than what was possible before. And like other comprehensive frameworks, right? Programming frameworks. It of course comes with various toolings, with documentation, uh, with tutorials, videos, seminars, and everything around it, right? And you can build blockchains with that framework that have nothing to do with Polkadot. Um, they may look vastly different than what, what you are aware of what blockchains might be. Um, as what you've seen with Ethereum smart contract platform or Celo, um, um, a, a more like open finance system um, or Bitcoin, which is um, a bit simpler uh, case. Now, so important to understand is this tool substrate was really built to supercharge innovation. It allows you to go in, take this framework, and build in relatively short time a fully functioning blockchain network. Now, and the great thing about it is why it, why it has become so easy to build blockchain with substrate is because we, we made it very modular. So, so you're able to accomplish an awful lot of different things that otherwise would be difficult by basically just creating um, new modules and plugging them together in a very sophisticated environment that will allow you to combine and compose these different pieces of functionality very efficiently. Now, what we've really tried to do is like get the trade-off between generality and optimality right. Create a framework that is applicable to what you wanna build and do, but at the same time ensure that is optimal for this case. Now, Polkadot is really its counterpart. It's a network interface to that operating system. And it really ensures that you don't end up in, this, in, in a world where you have all these disparate, disparate chains, these 
isolated data silos, right? That don't can't talk to each other, then are also fairly insecure because they all have to self-secure themselves. So it essentially and fundamentally does two things only, Prokolo. And one is it secures a chain that wishes to connect it to it, right? And by design, every chain that is being built today on Substrate is interoperable with Polkadot. So somebody, um, one of the projects that spoke before, like brought forward building a solution. Well, you can take, for example, Substrate and um, build your own private permission chain. And at a later point in time, you say, um, you know, I, I want to be part of a public network. I want to be able to um, interact with assets or logic that's lying on uh, potentially even a, as a third party network like Ethereum or some of the parachains are the, the blockchains that are being deployed on Polkadot. And there's no issue with doing that at any point. You don't have to consider anything today when you design your blockchain, as long as you design it with Substrate. Now, if we look a bit at the um, Substrate ecosystem right now, um, we released the first version of Substrate roughly a year ago. Um, uh, just recently, I think like a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, released, we released the version two uh, release of um, Substrate and had our first community conference that was well attended with like, um, I, I think like one, one and a half thousand people that attended of which only half of had them had um, 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 worked with Substrate. Now, and we really see projects in our ecosystem emerge in every basically industry vertical. Here brought you like a very limited overview. Um, this is roughly a third of the companies that we observe in our space at the moment. Now, to give you some understanding, within a year, um, we, we have gotten to a place where we have um, quite a few people quite a few companies um, into experimenting with Substrate, right? So 105 companies I'm aware of um, are building blockchains with Substrate today, right? We have seven main networks running um, and, and it's, it's well distributed around the globe. I don't wanna go into details here, but one thing I wanna talk about um, for a second, and that's the composition of these things that are being built with these tools that I presented. And largely, I see, I see three different areas, um, um, three different buckets that these chains can be put into. One bucket here on the right are like domain-specific chains. So these um, really focus on a certain problem domain, on something that is um, um, general across industry, across verticals. Right. So uh, one example of a domain specific chain could be a file storage chain, something like Filecoin, right? A chain that um, would be used by all sorts of applications in all sorts of industries, right? It's generally needed and useful. And similar with um, 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 certain privacy um, uh, preventing technologies, uh, preservation technologies, identity is another of these areas. And I think a good chunk or the largest chunk, actually, it doesn't look like that in this diagram, but it's a good chunk, if not the largest chunk in our ecosystem is uh, taken up by domain specific chains. The next bigger buckets, or at the moment, maybe a bit bigger, are industry specific chains. So these are blockchains that say, well, I, I'm not necessarily pro providing um, um, a solution to um, a, a problem domain that's as broad as storage, but I think I can build a platform. So really a platform. So a thing where other people contribute to and interact through. Um, and that is better if I, you know, accumulate and concentrate it within a chain. Um, and a great example are the DeFi chains that we have recently seen spun up. Um, one example is a project called Arcala and Lamina, which is basically a stable coin with a bunch of other DeFi primitives, decentralized sinus primitives, that they bake into um, the, the blockchain runtime and thereby optimize, um, uh, optimize it strongly. And, but at the same time, they, um, 
host a um, smart contract module that allows their users to, to, to develop applications on top. That's an, that's an example of an industry specific chain, right? It focuses on one vertical, on that vertical only, and tries to um, uh, put together a good offering for that vertical. And another example would be um, what um, your, your co-students talked about earlier, MediLedger. MediLedger is actually one of the um, companies based in San Francisco, a um, company called Chronicled that builds um, with Substrate. Um, so they are in the progress of, of um, 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 you know, um, bringing out the new version on Substrate. Uh, they, back in the days, they worked with Parity Ethereum, so our Ethereum client, um, but they hit, like many others, limitations, particularly around confidentiality. And because Substrate gives you so much more um, low-level access and freedom around designing the business logic and the functioning of your blockchain, you suddenly can um, utilize newer technologies early and more efficiently. Um, first and foremost, obviously, zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge technology um, that due to the low level access, you can now implement without requiring, for example, uh, the Ethereum protocol to come together and um, add pre-compiles to the Ethereum virtual machine. Now, yeah, um, as it might be relevant to you guys. So there's a bunch of different um, um, support streams happening in, in our ecosystem. So like if you're interested in general in this Web3 vision, or if you're interested in, in building that technology stack out, right? Or if you're interested in just building your use case on top of it. Um, there are a bunch of, I guess, like support structures in place um, in, in the blockchain space in general um, that are um, there for you. So if you're looking for funding, right? Uh, there are two things I wanna point out. The Web3 Foundation that I was speaking about earlier, um, within the last year, got 250 proposals for grants and awarded 100. Uh, I think we roughly spent like five or 10 million roughly last year on, um, on grants. And the estimated yearly spend for the next years will be 20 million. So um, a requirement is to you know, be granted uh, one of these grants is that you build open source technology, right? It needs to be free and open. But if you have ideas and if you think that can give you a business started, right, I highly recommend you to um, apply, reach out. Also feel free to send me an email and put you in touch with relevant people. But more importantly, um, we launched a network. So um, the community launched Polkadot in May of this year. And Polkadot is one of the first networks that has on-chain governance. So Polkadot stakeholders can, you know, vote and make decision on chain, and these ch these changes are enacted within the chain without the need for anyone external to take any action, such as updating your nodes. And um, furthermore, this network has a treasury, so it basically, you know, takes care of its own money. And this treasury currently has like, I don't let me lie, I think like something like 40 million in it. And due to the um, how fees flow and uh, new minted coins flow into the treasury, what we will, what we expect, what we project for the next 12 months is that until August next year, this treasury size will probably grow to 300 million. What I wanna, I wanna say by that is I think even on that side, there's massive opportunities to come up with proposals, right? That the community, the Polkadot community feel comfortable funding and uh, participating in that. But beyond and above that, it is incredibly interesting to see for your first, for the first time, right? Like um, some kind of organization that is an illegal entity in that sense to able to um, you know, work for itself or have other people work for itself and fund their work, 
which is essentially the case. Like people on the network, Polkadot network, vote for, you know, um, where should this money be allocated? Um, right. Um, and thank you so much on that end. Um, do I have another two minutes to touch on the Jordan refugee camp, the use case? Of course. Go ahead. Awesome. Okay. Then let me give you a quick view in one of these use cases that we have worked with. Ah, good. The students can always queue up their questions in chat if you have something that uh, you wanted to ask. That way they would be ready for our guest speakers. Oh, yes, please. Questions. Um, can you still see my screen? Yeah, right. I guess so. Great. So um, here's one of um, the things that um, that we've built with blockchain to make it a bit more relatable. So uh, that started in, I think, 2017 uh, was the first time I sat together with the United Nations World Food Programme. Um, the quick brief thing, United Nations World Food Program provides roughly 80, 80 million people um, in 80 countries with food, with aid, mostly in the, in the form of food or cash. And historically, the World Food Program would only uh, distribute food directly, right? But they figured out cash transfers are a lot more effective in, in those areas where they are markets, right, where there is a basic functioning market infrastructure. And but there are problems with that. So um, so there are problems with um, cash transfer. So and um, I want to elaborate these a bit on the, the specific case we were working on. So the specific case was um, the, the World Food Program came to us and said like, hey, we have the Syrian refugee camp in Jordan, um, I think with half a million people. And um, currently, um, we, we want to do cash-based transfers there. We want to give the refugees access to cash so that they can go with the cash to the market and um, get their food. Now, the, one of the issues has been that, um, number one, um, they relied on the local banking infrastructure. So different banks that then, again, made agreements with these retailers or some other markets that would provide the food. What happened is that, um, please don't name me down on that number, but I think like around like 30% went into dark pots, right? Fraud, coercion, and data mismanagement. They were just gone. And um, beyond that, right, you have a fee of like 1.5 1 to 3% on every transaction that happened. Um, it could only be done there where you had local banking infrastructure and you had this um, relatively long setup time for any kind of new entrance into that system. All over, it was relatively unsatisfying. So what we built together with the World Food Program and uh, a couple of other partners was, um, a, a blockchain-based record system in some way that um, were individuals, these refugees, were directly identified through their biometric data. And we did this trial in Zatari Jordan with 200,000 people. So as you can imagine, what it was precisely is um, you have basically these refugees, families, each individual refugee was um, identified through an iris scanner. Um, I would have preferred we used mobile phones, but um, in, in, in these refugees camps, there is problem with theft and, um, and, and, and force in families, um, you know, so that, um, you know, in physical devices couldn't be used for that case. So um, we used an iris scanner instead. And what happens is that the World Food Program each month gives each of the refugees um, um, a certain allowance and entitlement to um, certain products in the form of like some kind of, you know, tokens, so to say. And these refugees can then go to um, 
um, these supermarkets and markets around the refugee camp that are integrated in that system and spend their, their, um, their allowance after authenticating themselves through their IOS. And yeah, so basically that cut out the local retail banks that uh, made it very transparent where actually these donations were being delivered to. It ensured that there was a good distribution among the refugees as well, right? Everybody gets their part in some way. And um, 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 not only the, basically the dark, dark holes were closed, but also the transaction fees were substantially lowered. Um, this is actually, this, these are the results from 2018. We are now at 500,000 refugees monthly, um, and then have expanded to a refugee camp in Bangladesh, um, where the same thing is happening. And um, the World Food Program in 2018 already was 100,000. They estimated a savings of roughly $40,000 per month, um, which accounted for an elimination of 98% of financial transaction fees. Yeah, and there are a bunch of opportunities in that regard. Like we are currently in talks with, um, together with the World Food Program, with a bunch of a couple of other agencies that are looking to join that network and expand on it in order to enhance this with um, solve certain problems for refugees around identity um, um, and and uh, such other things. That is a pretty simple case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bjorn, and uh, thank you uh, also for being awake at such an early hour. Uh, I, I imagine it's five five a.m. ish. No, it is. Yes, I'm a, I'm a bit gone. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? I would love to. Hey, Bjorn, I've I've got one question. It's uh, it's, it's great to connect, with Liam. You're here <laughs> again. <laughs> we feel like we run into each other everywhere these days yeah. um but you know great presentation you know you know i'm obviously a big fan of, of polka dot and substrate and all the rest of it um you know you started off the presentation just talking about the security of hacks and you know that's kind of one of your big motivations i'm curious to know whoops hand on my computer just shut off. Oh, no. All right, I was here. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, I, I know that there was the big parody hack a few years ago where I think off the top of my head, it was like $30 million lost and $150 million locked up, you know, indefinitely. Um, I'm curious to know, just since you guys were kind of at the helm of that, what you guys learned specifically from that experience as well. A bunch of things, many, 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 many things. So, like, um, so we learned uh, we learned quite a lot with regard to um, processes, processes, of course, right? Internal processes around like QA, how you deploy, how you do certain things there in order to be extra sure around things. We also learned that. I mean, we kind of knew that before, but like we, you know, it, it showed us to it again that this technology wasn't right for prime time, for the prime time it saw in general. So um, I, I strongly believe that Ethereum 1, and even as it stands today, is the, you know, rather prototype than more, and shouldn't be handling that amount of value. Um, um, that was another thing. Furthermore, that, you know, I guess like, even in our space where, you know, the kind of like responsibility is being pushed to the edge of, yeah, you, you verify, right? It's all trustless. You, you have to check the code yourself. Nobody does. And everybody will blame you for it, right? Which I can, I can appreciate a lot and understand. Um, that's another thing I, I think I learned. Um, yeah, and that... I, I think regulation and legal constraints can be an absolute peter if you are running a company in our space and you may not be able to um, interact with your community how you would like to and how you think it, it would be right. These are some of the things we learned for sure. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. 
So one, one question from this, uh, from this side. So you, you just mentioned regulations. Um, which regulatory body and in which country do you think is going to create the most, the most friction? Is it going to be the US? Is it going to be Europe? Um, is, it, is it the fact that crypto is still uh, semi-illegal even though widely used in, in Asia? But what, what, do you, what do you see on the horizon? I, I realize you're looking at the technical aspects, but you know, one stroke of a pen of a, of a regulator and, and a business model can, can cease to exist, right, in, the, in this space. So can you, can you comment a little bit on, on that and what do you see and who you're talking to, if you can? Yep, um, uh, for sure, my pleasure. Um, so we, we take a fairly proactive approach uh, to regulation. So we have gone um, um, very early on proactively um, towards the SEC, for example, in the US and um, um, looked for the dialogue um, because um, I think like we all strongly believe this technology is here to stay and it should stay and we get a 